Okay, good morning everyone and thanks for your attendance, um, both physically here in Hermanus and those of you online. It gives me a pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Dave Cornell. Many of you will know him. Dave has been around the traps um, for many years. Um, he has a lecturer at various universities in South Africa um, and he's had a long association with the University of Gothenburg. Um, in Sweden and at equally Stellenbosch. Dave was born in, in the Cape, attended Ronnebosch Boys High School, did a BSc Honours in Geochemistry at UCT in 71, and a PhD in Mineralogy and Petrat Petrology at the University of Cambridge in 1975. His thesis title was Petrology of the Marydale metabasites, um, part of the, the very large and extensive um, Fentersdorp sequence. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on his CV, which is very impressive, but he's going to talk to us today about the Fentersdorp, one of these um, very large igneous provinces that are sort of becoming um, the vogue again, and lots of people now are interested in re-looking at them. So thanks, Dave, for making yourself available. We look forward to your presentation. Um, his CV has been circulated on the OGG group newsletters, so you can find it there, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Well, here's the presentation. Yeah, these are my co-authors. Gerard Mankies, Willem van Abestosen at Pre-State, Dirk Fry and Magnus uh, Christofferson. Gerard has had a brain aneurysm not that long ago, and he's recovering. And Willem is uh, struggling with eyesight. So I'm the sort of most active of the three of us. And Dirk and Magnus have been helping me with dating. Okay, this is the, these are the contents. I'm going to talk about st stratigraphy, Dirk on dating, the dating story on the fence store, and the conundrum then geochemical discrimination and dating the clip refuse bear with larvas, sills, and dikes, and then some work that I'm busy preparing for publication at the moment, or in fact, revising a publication, and then some conclusions. Right, here's the Fenter's Dorp. This is the sub outcrop on the carp bald craton, very large and a much smaller. An actual outcrop. But as you know, the Fendersdorp overlies the Vidvartisrand. And so there's a huge amount of drill core being drilled through it to see whether there is bits underneath it. Here are some localities, Pretoria there, Kimberley, Prisca, and Tacope. So the stratigraphy looks like this. It's it's a very thick sequence, can be sort of five kilometers thick. At the base, there's the clip refuse bear, which is called a group. And it, there are a lot of different formations, but they're all essentially basalt or comatiite. Then there's some sedimentary sequences, which I've not colored in. Camille Durans here, Waterville there, Ritchart, which is mixed. And the Makossi, the only rhyolite in the supergroup. So this is the only place where there are plenty of zircons. The Allen Ridge is at the top. Uh, a bit about zircon dating. There are three uranium, uh, sorry, two uranium isotopes, 238 and 235, and then there's a thorium isotope here. And they give rise to these lead isotopes with half-lives shown here. You see 238, 206 has got a very long half-life, four four and a half billion years. 235, much shorter, only 700 million years, and thorium, like 14 billion. And this explains why there's so little 235 left, because, of course, the Earth and the um, nuclear synthesis process before that is, is about 4.6 billion years, and so we've gone through about seven half-lives of 235 uranium. There's not very much of it. All right, yeah, here's another feature. If your system starts off with some lead in it, then you can see this by looking at 204, which is not a radiogenic lead isotope. So if you see some 204, 
then you know they're going to be some other some of these other lead isotopes and the ratio between 204 and the others are known reasonably well depending on the age and then another added problem is that in the one instrument which we're using largely nowadays the icpms there's also a bit of mercury in the argon and so this has got uh, isotope 202 and 204 which unfortunately interferes with 204 lead and so it's not as easy to see whether there's any common lead as it as it is with the iron probe which doesn't have this mercury problem right how do we analyze how do we date things with so all we analyze zircon grains usually in the old days it was a multi-grain sample maybe 100 grains nowadays we tend to go for micro beam dating which is just a little spot in a single grain and then the material gets put into a mass spectrometer so when you've done an analysis you check the data to see if there's any common lead like you you can use the 206 to a 4 ratio compared with standards most of the standards have no common lead so you can see how much what this ratio should look like if there's no common lead and if there is then you either reject the data or you correct it using the um, your estimate of how much 204 and that gives you idea of how much 206 and 207 they are but when you've done that you can calculate the two uranium lead edges and you, you can also in some instruments you can also calculate a thorium lead edge if these two uranium lead edges agree then the determinations said to be concordant if they don't agree then you try a lead loss model which is not as reliable but does work quite often so when you've got a number of analyses you can you can combine them and you can calculate a combined age and and of course you also have to calculate the errors which due to the counting statistics and other uncertainties and they're usually quoted nowadays at two sigma or 95 percent confidence meaning that if you did this age determination a hundred times then about five of those determinations would lie outside the errors of that uh, that you calculated so here's some pictures of zircon zirconium silicate this is an optical image showing a very nice crystal which I got from the web. And here's a couple of images which we use to select our spots. This is a, a zircon grain mounted in epoxy and polished and then imaged with the electron microscope. You can see largely cracks and some small details here in a backscattered electron image. And here's a spot from an iron probe. We usually use cathode luminescent images to select our spots usually in combination with the with the backscattered electron image here you see cracks which you want to avoid because they often have lead in them and in the cl image we know that the dark points are high uranium and the and the bright points are lower uranium and here's a pretty picture just to show there is a bit of fun in in geochronology now, some of the instruments that can be used here's an iron probe in Stockholm, the Nordsim iron probe with Martin Whitehouse, who's running it. And it's a huge instrument with a very high resolution because the problem is there are some interferences with the lead isotope. So you need very high resolution. And it's a very expensive instrument, about 40 million Rand nowadays. Of course, the, the first iron probe that did dating successfully was was in Australia the shrimp and if you wanted to do dating in the shrimp you had to take a big hunk of money or a bucket full of money there and work with somebody who would operate the instrument for you nowadays there's a cheaper alternative this probably only costs about five or six million rand the the multi-collector laser ablation ICPMS and this is the one in Oslo which I've been using it's got a laser ablation sampler which makes the little holes in the zircon 
using an ultraviolet laser. They put through a, an inductively coupled flame, as it were, which which atomizes the whole thing, and then it goes into a mass spectrometer there. So here's an example of a run in a, in a laser ablation, ICPMS. Here's the background, which is before you start the laser. Then you start the laser, and of course the signal goes up, and here you see the different isotopes. So here's 238 uranium, which as we know goes to 206 lead. And so this ratio here is going to give you one of the ages. Here's 232 thorium, which is going to 208 lead. And here's 207 lead. We don't actually count 235 uranium because the, the ratio between 235 and 238 is constant. Um, what's the story so far with the uh, dating on the Fentastort? Well, the base is younger than 2799 because I did some work on the um, detrital zircons, and that's the age of detrital zircons, so that the uh, formation is younger than that. In other words, 2,800 million years. The Transvaal, at the, which overlies the Fentestorp, is starts off at 2642. So that's the sort of age range in which the Fentestorp could be. Now, the first decent age on the Fentestorp was by Rich Armstrong using the shrimp in Australia. All the dating before that had, had been very... Uh, inaccurate and, and, in fact, far too young. So Rich got uh, 2714 plus or minus 8, or 2691 plus or minus 14, or this is my um, estimate. And here's a, a summary of what happened. He um, separated zircons from 52 kilograms of sample and found about 12 grains. He did 18 iron probe points, which probably cost about 50,000 rand of um, today's money. And his answer was 2714 plus or minus 8. But the trouble was that most of his grains had common lead in them, so he had to do a common lead correction. And he, he chose to use the 208 lead correction, which I'm not going to talk much about. But if you use the 2 or 4 lead correction, which is more common, you get a different age, quite a bit younger. Anyway, that stood for quite a long time, but then we started getting much more precise ages, and later work showed that neither of these ages could really be actually correct within the errors. So I've looked at the data again, and noticed that there are five points that don't have any common lead in them. So if you use just those, you get 2711 plus or minus 22, which does seem to be okay um, considering the later work. Right, then, um, as I said, the Makwasi formation has got tons of zircon in, so it's not difficult to date that. And I've done four samples in different places, and, and the weighted mean is 2720 plus or minus 2 million years. The rich actually got 2709 plus or minus 4, which suggests that, as many geochronologists claim, their errors are too small. So this would, would um, probably be okay with an, with an error of like 12 million years or so. Also dated the Huthunach, and this is the, the number we've got on two samples. Unfortunately, at the bottom of the Vesselton mine, in the in supposed Hutuna, we get 2781 plus or minus 5, which is seems to be a reliable age, but probably isn't actually the Hutuna. And then uh, de Kock has got 2733 on a tough sample from Taun. Schneiderhahn dated a lot of detrital zircons in the same formation and got 2716, plus, uh, yeah, plus or minus 16, which means that sample must be younger than that. Okay, then there are lots of dikes and sills outside the Fentestorp repository, and uh, Ulf Söderlund and his group at uh, Lund have been doing a lot of work on 
badly outdating in dikes and sills. Now, badly out is a zirconium oxide, and it does also have uranium and thorium in, so it can be used for dating. It's found only in rocks which are low in silica, like gabbros and things. And it only works on unmetamorphosed rocks because when they're metamorphosed, the badliat tends to change into zircon. Anyway, here's um, results on two sills in the Witz group near Frieda Fort are 2788 plus or minus 2. And he reckoned that as this falls in the right age range for the for the Fentestor, he he decided this was dating the Klipperfirsberg. And if in fact if you look at the geochem, which we will in a little while, it does correspond to Klipperfirsberg geochemically. Then there's also um, the Kanye rhyolite near Haberoni and the Dadaport basalt, which is associated with it. And that's got an age of 2782. So the, the possibility is that the Klipperfirsberg might actually be, be this old, 2780, 2781, something like that. So the conundrum about the Fentestor, the large igneous province, is they usually only last about 10 million years. So how many large igneous provinces are there in the Fentestor? The first alternative is that there's only one. And that, that would mean that almost all the Fentestor volcanics should be around about this age. The second alternative is that there might be two. If the Klipperfuse back is that old, 2780, then there would be a 60 million year interval before you got to the younger Plattberg, large igneous province in which the Makwasi and the Hutwina are. So we need better dates on the Klipperfuseberg and of course the Allen Ridge at the top as well. The trouble is there's not much zircon in them. Now looking at the geochemistry of Fentersdorf which I'm not going to talk a lot about, but uh, Bowen, for example, did a lot of work on it. And the idea was here, when you were drilling through the fence stalk, trying to get to the bits, geochemically, you might be able to work out where you were, and that would tell you whether to go on drilling, to stop, what to do. So in this diagram, based on titanium, zirconium, and phosphorus, which are, which are um, quite small ions and have a high charge, they are not easily affected by metamorphism. So we reckon even though the Fentersdorf is metamorphosed in Greenshus facies, these elements probably haven't changed, haven't moved much. Anyway, here you see the Klipperfuge bat with a nice field, the Allen Ridge, some rocks in the Dominium group, and here the Mafic rocks in the Chutronoch and Makwasi. And here are the felsic rocks of the Makwasi. So you can see that this sort of diagram can be pretty useful. As long as you know that you're in the fence door, and maybe you've got some other stratigraphic constraints, you can see more or less which formation you're in. One problem, though, is that you see in the Clipper Fuseback group, Mid-Ocean Ridge Basalt and Primordial Mantle also sit there. So if you just take any old mantle, either depleted mantle or an ordinary um, sort of primordial mantle, and melt it up to a large extent, you're probably going to end up in this field. Right, so here are some of the dikes and sills that have been used to um, possibly date the Klipperfuseberg. Now, I've, I've listed these things. Here are the two that uh, Gumsley is using to say that this is the age of the Klipperfuseberg. They do have Klipperfuseberg geochemistry, and they might be all right. But you see here that there's a much younger one, which is actually Transvaal age, which has also got Klipperfuseberg geochemistry. It's obviously too young. And here's a Rykopis dike, which is about the same age as the Makwasi. And that's also got to produce back geochemistry. So it might also be all right. So as you can see, the dikes, although they might be right, we're not sure whether they um, 
actually date the volcanic rocks of the Fentastorp because they lack the stratigraphic context. Right, so here's some recent work which we've been doing in a, a locality called Cape. This is a map from Rogers and de Toy in 1910 showing the, the sort of southwestern edge of the Carpal Craton along the Dornberg Fault. Prisco's over here, Brettstown's down there. This is old Dwyker. That's Transvaal. Here's old granite, the pink stuff. And here's the little outcrop at Cope, which is one of the really best outcrops of the Fentastorp because it shows quite a bit of stratigraphy. The dip is about 30 degrees to the northwest at Cope. And the stratigraphy looks like this. There's basement granite. Then there's a sediment, largely sedimentary formation, which is almost certainly Camille Duran's formation. It's got some tufts in it. It's overlapped by the Makwasi formation and then the Ritkhat, which is uh, largely uh, mafic rocks with some sedimentary rocks. Here's a little map showing you the um, where the, the basal Camille Duran's formation is and some samples which various people have taken, overlain by the Makwasi formation, which we also dated here, and it is Makwasi, 2720 plus or minus 2. Anyway, so the interesting thing for this talk is the Camille Duran's formation tufts. Here's the Maritztam granite at the base. It's overlain by this Camille Duran's conglomerate. And in the conglomerate, there are tufts. And here's a very nice outcrop showing layers in the tufts, in the weathered surface. Here's a fresh surface, which doesn't really show any de detail. But if you polish it, suddenly emerge these um, little round blobs, which are accretionary lapilli. See, when explosive eruptions happen, you get these little fragments, in this case, uh, slightly uh, slightly philosophic, being thrown up into the air. You get a nue ardent developing, a, a fluidized flow. And as the stuff moves down slope, it picks up extra volcanic material, and then is finally deposited as a a tuff with uh, this ash in between the accretion in the pili. So that's quite fun because it tells you that on a particular day, 2,700 and something million years ago, this Nue Ardant came down and was deposited. There are also some raindrops known from this locality which show that um, it actually also rained, but it was probably sulfuric acid. Right, now, trying to date these tufts. Uh, they did have quite a bit of zircon in them. Here is a, an epoxy mount with the zircons in them, polished to, and uh, imaged by electron microscope. Here are the samples, 2110, 2111, and 2112. See, they've all got quite a lot of zircon in Here's a Makwasi sample, which we also dated. And here's a standard 91500. So the first set of dating results, here are the samples plotted on a Concordia diagram. And you can see that most of the points are concordant, but there are, quite, there are some that are discordant. In other words, not giving the same 206-238 as the, the 207-235. So if we only plot the concordant dates within about 10% of, of discordance, we see that, yeah, in fact, most of these zircons are almost certainly xenocrists because they're between 2800 and 3100, much too old to be fentastor. But there are a few little grains here with, a, with ages around about 2700. So we could concentrate on those. And here's an example. This is the uh, backscattered electron image showing this grain number four. And here's the original laser ablation spot that was in it. 
and we could manage to put in a couple more. So there were actually four younger grains that we could redo. And here are the numbers on. So here are the spots. And the number is 2736, 2731, 2725. And then one which is quite clearly older. That's still Fentestal Beige. Right, so there, there are the numbers. And if you combine them, you get 2728 plus or minus 7. They're in two different samples, but these TUFs seem to not be very different in age. So the conclusion is that TUFs are actually this age if the zircon is co-magmatic. In other words, if the zircon actually formed from that magma. But there's a possibility that they're actually xenocrysts, just like all the older stuff. In other words, picked up from something as this volcanic material was coming up. And then there's this older grain, 2781, which is still within the Fentestal range and shows that there was something going on at 2780. Now, looking at the geochem of these samples, the tuff samples all plot in the Klipperfusberg field, apart from the still one, which is trying to tell you it's Allen Ridge, but it can't be Allen Ridge because it's below the Makwasi. So it seems pretty likely that these are Clipperfuse Bear. Here are some of the uh, Felsic uh, Makwasi formation rocks. Okay, now it turns out that there are two other profiles that, that are rather similar to this. There's a borehole in the Free State examined by Schneiderhan in our PhD. And you can see this is a bit more extensive. It's actually got Cliprophius below the uh, Camille Durance. Then, interestingly, in the Camille Durance itself, there is basaltic lava, which Schneiderhan reckons is definitely Cliprophius type. But it's above this first conglomerate. And then there are some tufts in here. And her, she didn't date the tufts, but her detrital zircon age was 2716. Then there's another sequence described at Town by de Kock, who did um, Paleomag on it, and he dated a tuff sample from this Camille Duan's formation, 2733 plus or minus 8. And it's also found that there's accretionary lipili in it. So it seems very likely that this is the same tuff as we're seeing in these other units. So, some conclusions. The basal sedimentary unit at Tukarip is part of the Camille Duans formation. And we think that lavas and tufts in the Camille Duans formation are the final stage of Cliprofusbear, based on their stratigraphic position and their geochemistry. So that means that the, the Camille Duans formation is clearly dated at something like 2733, if all those tough zircons are co-magmatic, or if it if they're not, if there's Xenocris, then the age is between 2733 and 2722, which is the age of the overlying Makwasi formation. So you see where this is going. The only microbeam date on on uh, lavas, I've interpreted as 2711 plus or minus 22 which is within error of our TUF dates. And that would be the mean 2732. So we think that the 2788 million year old Badliite dates on SILs probably are not Cliprofusberg. They do have Cliprofusberg-like geochemistry, but so do a lot of younger dikes. And that, of course, the dikes always lack stratigraphic context. So here the conclusions are compiled and the um, the final idea is alternative one is probably correct. All the Fentestorf volcanics form a large igneous province at this age range, 2723. Mm, that sounds a bit wrong. 2733, I think it is, to 2720. Right, so that's the talk.
Right, any questions? Yes, please. We've got Keith Kenyon here, who's going to come up to the mic. Hi, Dave. He's Dave, when I heard about your talk, I went back to my old database. I've got the old Geochem database. I was a guy that developed a technique in Anglo Gold of predicting where the boreholes were by doing the geochemistry of the fender's door. And I've got a huge mm -hmm. large database. I've also got a dike database for Western Deep Levels. I've still got all the geochemistry. But what we also did, we've got ages, which I did with Rich Armstrong and the shrimp, which have never seen the light of day. Mainly mm -hmm. on the conya and the, and the gabaron granite. And my question is, is where do you see the, the, the conya volcanics fitting in all this model? Yeah, um, we don't really know. They're, they're just outside the Fender Store Propository. And they are interbedded with this um, mafic rock, whose name I can't remember right now. But um, I think they are yeah, they are older than the actual Finderstorp. If our story is correct, then the the, the Finderstorp actually only started at uh, twenty seven thirty. And not we died some some seven. boreholes in Botswana um, and. The dates we got were um, 2775, 2777, 2780, and for the uh, uh, more kind of 2785, and then volcanics from the airport, which we didn't know what they were, but because they're slightly different in composition, with 2787, and then more at 2791. That's the sort of range of ages we got on the samples. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, that, that, that's established for the um, the Kenya and the Khabarani granite. Um, if, I, if you have time, Dave, I'd like to come across his turn bars. I don't yeah. Like yeah. Like Sorry, I didn't catch your name. And you can have a look at it and see if you can use any of it. I mean, the last time I looked at it was 27 years ago. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. Yeah, I'm. Um, that's that's a real problem area. Um, either they're correlated or they're not. Um, the Kenya volcanics actually plot geochemically the same as the Makwasi, although they are um, sort of sixty million years older. But um, yeah, we don't know. Dave, There's... can you see the text? Do you want to put back put up that last slide again, please? Okay. Yeah. Um, where's it gone? You've got to just sort of load your presentation again. There we go. It's not there. There we go. No, not that. Yeah, that one. Can you guys see it? It's a bit small. No. No, just... Go to, to, to presentation mode. Expand it. Okay. There you go. There we go. Okay. Right. Somebody said, Keith, is that database published and available to all? No, it's Anglo Gold's. It's, as I said, it's never seen the light of day. Okay, well, the yeah. question is can it be accessed and published? Where is it? Can I get the I put it down this morning until my computer. It's the only place that exists. Okay, but is it going to get published? I'm sure it's going to get published. I don't see the problem. Okay. So, so Neil, are you ready to publish some more on the vids? Where's Neil? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm back on, John. I didn't quite hear what Keith said. I think he said he was going to publish it and it was available to everyone. Is that right? It's not a public domain, no. We'd have to get permission to use it. But I, I thought this stuff was 10 or 20 years old. Yeah, but it's hidden in the basement. Of Most of the stuff Anglo Gold is thrown away. I've got it. They, they didn't know the value of it. And, and, and when they moved out of their little office here, they just, I tried to get hold of data a few months ago. It's just disappeared off the face of the earth. Tons of data. All the old basin analysis reports, which they spent millions on, have disappeared. But I've got most of the data I've got. But if you've got the only copy, surely it's important to get it out and make it available to everyone. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what well, I'm what? Are you saying it is available to everyone or not? 
You say I can do that by the week? Are you saying it's available to everybody or not? I'm, I'm, a, I'm saying that we can make arrangements to get it available. I cannot give it out now because I don't know even who's in charge of the state at Anglo Gold at the present time. Um, and some of that data has been dissipated to other companies because the balls have been given to people like Harmony. So it's going to be very difficult to work out what gives. Like the old basin analysis reports where a lot of this data exists. Um, I don't even know what happened to them other than some of the ones I've got. And the original copies which are with Andy Bonica, who's over in Australia. Yeah, yeah, Neil, that's a very good point that you raise. And I mean, this lost, you know, lost information is really bizarre. And all the more reason, uh, you, you know, that it's put in the public domain and that we have a system where we you know, after, what, 10 years or 20 years, Morning, Neil. you know, that we, we get it. Okay, after. how are you? Oh. Yeah, okay. I, I, I've just heard about this data for a long, long while and I just think it's really important from a national point of view that um, it, it gets out there so people can use it. Otherwise, it just gets lost and uh, we start again from scratch. Well, we don't actually start again. So I'm trying to push through and sort of see what does it need to actually say here it all is to everybody. The reason I have this data is when I resigned or retired from Anglo Gold, yeah. it was very really clear at that particular point that they were not going in that direction and the data no. and the oh. data banks and where the stuff was stored. I mean, for instance, all those deep seismic surveys we did, they spent a fortune on them. Half the traces we can't find anymore. Yeah. Okay. I understand yeah. all that, but, I'm, but we're not getting any closer to getting it out for national usage. Well, actually. Well, the thing is, the uh, sidetracked us. The can use it is quite well dated, um, and it's there's some published dates, and the data put um, is quite clearly related to it. Although it's not, um, the, there isn't an actual date on the data put as far as I, I know. So there's quite clearly was something going on at two seven eighty, but whether it's whether it's Fentersdorp or something earlier, we don't know. Ashley um, has got a comment there. Maybe you should tell us about that, Ashley. Unmute yourself, Ashley. Ashley, we need your input. Hello, thank you. I'm sorry, I've only got five minutes before I have to go to a meeting. But um, I just uh, would like to say that the Clipper of Viersburg uh, was uh, studied paleomagnetically by uh, Michiel de Kock, And he had published a paper in South African Journal of Geology. And the paleo pole for that is identical to both the Medipa Gabra and the Dedaput. Uh, basalt uh, and the Dirtaput basalt is dated by Wingate and I think it was in 1998 and uh, that's also 2780 so uh, I, I, I'm a firm believer in my, in my age is still are that the Clipper of Thiersburg is 2780 okay yeah that is possible the only trouble is that Paleo Pole is also the same as the Heckport which is um by two, 2. 2, yeah. 2, 2,400 now. Sorry. 2.2. Uh, 2. 2. Or you're 2. talking about the oncolo. 2. 2. Yeah, 2.2, 2. right. So yeah. the, the question is whether you whether the paleo mag is definitive, and I think probably it isn't. Uh, it's past uh, what they call a um, fold test. So you actually correct the for the folding, and it shows that it's primary based on that. Uh, I mean, I can't... Uh, I can't evaluate. I, I don't have the Heckwood paleo pole of hand, so I, I can certainly look at that if they are similar. If you look in the paper, you see the Heckwood is plotted there, and it's, it's right. <coughs> so that's that's the point. I mean, it might be right, but it's not it's not definitive. I mean, nothing's really definitive yet, is it? <laughs> I mean, of course, it would be nice to actually date the lava itself, but it's. Uh, yeah. As you know, it's not easy to take lava. Sure. Okay, but but I, I think that the reality here is that these lips, and that's part of the program we've just started with um, uh, Gillian Folger and overseas people, we, we need to relook at all of these large igneous provinces, Fentersdorp in particular. And, um, you know, it's great that we've got all of you on this call, including Neil Phillips and Keith, and we best get this data out there used properly. 
Lord, they are just looking at the monstrous number of ages that were just done before 1996 alone. Yeah. Since then, a huge amount has been done. More reliable and better equipment. Yeah. No, no, so there's a huge amount of information sitting in company files that really cannot be lost. And you should get it out there. Ashley, where are you based now? Uh, I'm in Poland, in, uh, in very close to Kat Katowice. But um, actually, I'm not, not going to be doing much. I mean, I, I've got some data to publish on South Africa still, but I'm actually not going to be doing so much work there <laughs> in the future. Okay, but I mean, you've still got a wealth of knowledge that needs to be added to the equation. Sure. I actually got some, uh, I got some sills uh, from Cheapers. What's this company that took over the Anglo Gold uh, core sheds um, in um, near Coltonville? I managed to get some of the sills um, uh, samples out of there, but unfortunately, I didn't get any good. They were simply too fine grained to date. These sills, they're actually sills within the fences dorp itself. So, actually, within the lavas. And I got some sills uh, sampled and I, I, I tried to get Bedeliate and Zircon out of them, but I wasn't very successful. Okay. Anyway, it's all good stuff. So I just go back to John talking about Fenster Talk as a sort of the Fortescue is part of the same story, you know? Is you the other story of Phillips? No, it's not. Because I wrote Fortescue later as well. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm not quite sure I can hear the question. Something to me. So part of the data set, we, at this stage when we were looking at the Fenders door, we were looking at the uh, Fortescue as well. And I collected quite a large number of dates for the Fortescue. And what I wanted to know from Neil is how much work has been done subsequent to the, the work we did back in the 90s on the Fortescue. Because that too is at that stage, I don't know what the opinion is today, was regarded as part of the, uh, the Fenders door blip. Same, same. Uh, that's a fairly wide can, I have, can I have a comment? Oh. Can I have a comment there? We, yeah, we no. looked at, we looked at, uh, we dated dikes from uh, the Black Range dikes in the Pilbara, which are sort of coeval with at least part of the Fortescue, and the Paleomag is not similar to the Fentersdorp uh, at all. <laughs> it's uh, very, very quite different. And the ages also are different. I mean, you know, within the same range generally, but they they vary quite a bit so i don't think they can myself neil comment oh look i i mean keith's really asking what's been done up in that area for the last 30 years i'm not the expert to ask on that um it's possibly a joel survey of western australia type mm. question but um i, I understand a a lot, but no i can't not off the top of my head there's quite a bit of data already been published mm. i haven't gone into it in any great detail but it doesn't agree exactly with anything that we know okay <clears throat> sorry okay. john i didn't i didn't catch your surname sorry who john this is john brister no oh was that John Bristow telling us about the ages in... Uh, no, no, it's no. Keith Kenyon. No, Keith Kenyon. Kenyon. John Kenyon. Keith Kenyon. Keith Kenyon. Keith. Okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Long time bits gold geologist sitting on all this information. So we've got to do something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. New knowledge right. <laughs> Let's get in touch, Keith. Yes, are you still in uh, Are you still in Bush now, Cape Town? Cape Town. Cape Town. Could I come across and see you? I mean, I live in your mornings. Yeah, so I, I actually live in Constantia, but uh, I'm associated with Stellenbosch. Yeah. I'll give him your details, Dave. Okay. Great, yeah. Dave. Because I'll just bring this stuff and you can look at it and see if it's of any use to you. Yeah. And thanks. the other thing is, we've got to locate the balls where all these songs were taken. I don't even know if they still exist. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, um, Dave, we also um, in, the, in August had a very interesting meeting with the CGS. And yeah. we also, as you're probably aware, we met up with Gerard Meinkes in yeah. um, Leesburg. 
And, and one of the things you'll know, and Keith knows, I mean, there is, there's, I guess, thousands of meters, you know, kilometers of core in these core sheds, you, you know, that have been mentioned here again today. And all of those core sheds are under huge threat again. You know, they, already a lot of the metal trays or zinc trays are being stolen for, obviously, you know, tin shacks, regrettably. And, and someone needs to put up their hand and make sure, you know, that the valuable stuff is, is, is preserved and worked on. So, you know, getting back into the Fentersdorp um, and just sorting it out must be a key, key part of, you know, work and um, a treasure trove of information that we as a geological community need to do something about. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, we need the likes of Neil and you and Keith and everyone else to... It's um, serious, it's really serious. Yeah. Anyway, so, you know, so there's a whole bunch of things to be done. Um, a lot of wonderful IP, you know, we've got Graham Palmer here too today from Ex Anglo. And he will be aware of lots of information too, but somehow that information needs to get better looked after. Yeah. Okay, let's start wrapping up. Any, any last questions, comments? And thanks for, Neil, thanks for your comments. Thanks, Keith. Um, you've obviously got some work to do. Um, any, oh, yeah. Anyone else? There's one last question here from Julian. Yeah, can, they Dave, have... can Dave tell us about the age of the fetters of alteration? Yeah. Yeah, there are quite a lot of um, argon dates and things like that. And uh, like the ages. It's either Bushveld age or, or quite close to it, sort of 2000, 2050. Uh, nothing very precise, but um, it's it's almost certainly related to either the bush uh, the Bushveld or um, or the um, uh, that uh, uh, the um, meteorite uh, story at about 2000. Uh, can I come in here, uh, Dave, again? New, uh, Dave Phillips and I did some dating when Anglo still had the uh, organ organ instrument, and we did some dating both on the Vits and the alteration of the door. We came up with very similar dates, around about 2 billion, 2.02 2 yeah. billion. Yeah, yeah, that <clears throat> seems to be right. There could be an earlier event, but um, that's the, most of the dates are around about two billion. Okay, so, so, so presumably that was an impact age, Frieda Fort. Either Frieda Fort or or Bush, the Bushveld event heating up the whole um, um, sequence. Okay. I think more likely the Bushveld event. Um, Stuart, Stuart gave us a wonderful tour. Um, a couple of weeks ago, around three or four, um, you know, another absolute jewel box and interesting yeah. names. We need, we need a group of people here, and you know, some of them are in the strong teeth yourselves. Okay. So you guys need it, you know, put aside the sort of yeah. previous work, right? And and and, and, and fair off findings, and, you know, so we get back into this. So you're really pulling together that information of his and and Willem's. But thanks, that was good. Thanks, Neil, and everyone else.